Hello, my name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 164. <laughs> conclusion. Yes, this is the conclusion of our single word vlog series and I was always going to end with conclusion and can I say I've received so many requests for this particular topic, whether it be from LinkedIn, from Twitter, from Facebook, from email, hi to all of you. But the first request for conclusion emerged right at the start of the series when I told our fantastic students at Flinders, look, I'm going to do a few just focused on a single word. And almost immediately, our wonderful Todd sent me an email and said, you know what, could we do a vlog on conclusions? and the conclusion, and I went, Todd, you've got yourself a deal. As always, Todd was way ahead of the pack. He is incredibly prescient, and all these other requests indeed followed Todd's. So Todd, it is a privilege to work with you as always, and this vlog, as so many vlogs, dedicated to you, mate. So let me sort of capture what the requests after Todd's asked for. Let me explain the scenario, and this was pretty common between all the different requests. The most common scenario was somebody was about to start their conclusion and they were completely paralysed. So they just did not know where to start. And that was the phrase that was used. I need to write my conclusion. I don't know where to start. And they are frozen. And to cite that great philosopher Elsa, cold doesn't bother me anyway. So this vlog, I'm hoping, will quickly and sharply show you how to do a conclusion. So the goal of the work that I'm doing today is, firstly, I'm going to provide the characteristics of what makes a, a good conclusion. But I also try to make sure there's a meta point through each of the arguments I'm making. And that is, wherever you are, I want to present maybe just one strategy to stop your paralysis stop you being frozen, just one thing that might get you started into your conclusion. So I'm going to provide 10, Tara's 10 tips, I'm going to provide 10 nodes or 10 points for your consideration and one of the 10 might just provide the release for you. And for those of you out there that are doing just fine with your conclusion, rock and roll, that's brilliant. So those 10 strategies might just be a checklist to see that everything is going well. Now let me state very clearly, short and mediocre conclusions in a PhD, incredibly common. And it's common for two reasons. Firstly, I think there's so much debate and discussion, most of it completely pointless to be honest with you, but about the different disciplines and oh yes, well conclusions are completely different in different disciplines. Maybe, but frequently not. All the disciplines in terms of the conclusion have much more in common than they do actually different. But also, the reason why so many PhD conclusions are mediocre at best is that the students are not thinking clearly. They're tired, and let's be honest, you just want this thing over. So that's just about the worst combination you can have when someone's having to produce a bright, bouncy, powerful bit of prose. And that means when examiners come to read your conclusion, it's short, it's ill-focused, it wanders about the thesis, and does not provide the value add that's required of a conclusion. So team, what the point of a conclusion in a PhD is, is it must value add to your thesis. I also want to be clear, a poor conclusion does not fail your thesis. A poor introduction and a poor reference list, bi list, bibliography, yep, that fails your thesis. But if you simply run out of puff at the end, which is very common, then a poor conclusion tumbles a really, really strong thesis into a mediocre thesis. And I've examined where are we at? Probably about five theses where I was going, I'm going to give this an A. I'm going to give this a one. This is going to go straight through. And I got to the conclusion, the student was tired, and that one or A tumbled to a three or a C. Major corrections. And of course, the major correction was, dude, write me a conclusion. So let's do this. Conclusion. Firstly, they do differ by disciplines, and let me try and provide the shape for you. Yes, the sciences have shorter conclusions, 
the humanities have, you've guessed it, longer conclusions, and the social sciences, like Goldilocks' chair, is somewhere in the middle. Just right. So, can I quantify the length? Well, look, yes, I can. I've been doing research on it since Todd's suggestion about 10 weeks ago, and I reckon I can. But I need to put a caveat in there for us all, okay? Remember, I often describe doctoral examination as a dark art, and I do that for a reason. I read hundreds of examination reports every single year. The nature of being a Dean of Graduate Research, and remember there's one in every institution around the world, the nature of being a Dean of Graduate Research is we're probably some of the few people on planet Earth that read hundreds of examination reports far beyond one discipline, in fact in all disciplines. So from what I've read of examination reports in the last 20 years, the one thing I can tell you is every now and again about one in every 30 reports, some random examiner is going to pick something completely random that he or she has invented in their head as being incredibly important and that will impact on the students. So you can't predict what any examiner is going to do and that's why I call it a dark art. But let's get to that length. So for our science students, hard science students, get to 5,000 words, 5,000 words. So for our science crew, aim for that. Now some of you may be going, oh my God, how do I get there? I'm in this vlog, I'm going to explain to you how to get to 5,000 words. So that's the benchmark, if it's two, that's basically an honors conclusion. So this is a PhD, we've got to go up a bit, 5,000 words. Now for the social scientists, we add a few words to that because there are recommendations from your research and I'm going to show you how to deal with those. So that lifts the word length up a bit more in the conclusion for the social sciences. Now, for the humanities, this is your time to shine. You write a much, much longer conclusion. It's got to be punchy, it's got to be beautiful, it's got to be glorious and bouncy, terribly sexy. You are selling your work, you're selling your scholarship, and I'll talk about how to sell that well, but also not spruiking it, to sell your research with integrity. That's important. Okay, and so humanities conclusions can certainly get to 8,000 words and frequently get to 10,000 words. So get to 5, 8 to 10. That's the party. Now, where a short conclusion is a proxy for more than simply a tired PhD student is in the failed theses. Now, I have failed, dead fail, I have failed three uh, theses in my entire career. In fact, the third one happened only a couple of weeks ago. And yes, in that thesis that I failed, the conclusion was incredibly short. But the reason it was short is the thesis itself had done nothing. There was nothing to report. It was frankly really poor research and the bibliography reference list was actually less than I would expect in an honours dissertation, in fact much less. So by the time I was at the conclusion, it was a weird experience, there was absolutely nothing to report. The conclusion was poor because the thesis was poor. So it's not the conclusion's fault that the, that the thesis failed, it was the thesis. Therefore, you're different. You're amazing, you need to be confident. Your thesis is remarkable work and the conclusion is the time to frock up that fantastic research. So if you think about it in terms of exercise and fitness, right? What your thesis has been about, all that research is you've been exercising, you've been doing weights, you've got a good diet, you are looking fantastic. Yeah, come on, you are fabulous. So in the conclusion, you've done all this work, so don't wear a potato sack with a belt. And what I mean by that is don't write a potato sack conclusion. Show the work that you've done. Work it, frock up, be fabulous. You have a lot to say, and the conclusion will confirm that. Okay, so let's now quickly punch through Tara's 10 tips for writing a conclusion. So if you, and I know there's hundreds of you out there, if you are sitting, staring at your computer screen with that cursor doing this at you, freaks me out too, and you're going, where can I start? I want you to just pick one of the 10 things I'm about to talk about, the easiest, the one that goes, I can do that, pick that one and just start. Don't start at the beginning of the conclusion or at the end, pick a section and write it. So. One, tip number one, conclusions spring 
from the thesis. Now, as a, as a debater, the old rule of debating used to be that the third speaker, and I was always the third speaker, dialogue of, uh, the third speaker never introduces new material. I'll say that again. The third speaker never introduces new material. So in many ways, the conclusion of a PhD is the same. So your literature review chapter, if you have one, did the literature review. Your methodology chapter did the methods, you know where this is going, your, your results and outcome, yeah, that was in the thesis depending on the particular discipline you're in, you know, so, so those, that work, those chapters have already been done. So the conclusion does not present new data, but what it does do, wow, this is important, it reflects on the research. It creates a synthesis of all those chapters and it actually brings together the disparate arguments. It finishes off the work. It creates satisfaction, a satisfactory ending to the project. If I can go back to my frock an analogy, as I always do, the conclusion is like the hem of a frock. The frock may be absolutely beautiful, but if it's hemmed really badly and it's all fraying and all a bit weird, you lose the line of the frock. So hem your thesis well, give it a good shape, give it a good structure, make it feel complete. Okay, two, sell your wares. The conclusion must confirm to the examiner that you have made an original contribution to knowledge. And you need to use that phrase. My original contribution to knowledge is. Make that the topic sentence of your second, third or fourth paragraph in your conclusion. Because remember, your examiner has just waded through 90,000 words, perhaps with a glass of Chianti. And so therefore they're going to need to say, well, what, what, what have we been doing here? What have we actually been doing here? So you need to answer that question. Sell the thesis, and most importantly, sell its originality. Because remember, the difference between a master's and a PhD is originality. A great master's, and I believe in master's, I've done a research master's myself, is it synthesizes. A thesis is originality. You need to confirm that to get a PhD. So this is the innovation. This is the leap I have made and be avert about it in the conclusion. My original contribution to knowledge is, finish that sentence for me. Three, huge one. I think this is perhaps where the confusion's coming from, guys. Three, a PhD conclusion is more than a summary. This is the biggest mistake I think that punters make because they assume that a conclusion is a summary. And look, a summary is part of the conclusion, but a conclusion is more than a summary. Are you with me? So particularly, I think, in the empirical social sciences and the sciences, we do need to summarise our findings, OK? But the conclusion has to be more than a summary. So yes, write the summary of your research. Give me the what. What happened in the thesis? But remember the point, you're synthesizing everything to show me the why of the thesis, why it was written. So do the chapter review if you must. In chapter one of this thesis, in chapter two of this thesis, in chapter three of this, do that if you need to, and that's fine, do it. But then remember, you've got to plot it together. You've done the review, we've read the chapters, we know what the chapters did, but why do the chapters matter? That's the conclusion. Four, significance to the discipline. Now, I used the phrase that a conclusion is more than a summary in our last point. Now, what that more is, is how you have contributed to the discipline. So, yes, there is an original contribution to knowledge. My original contribution to knowledge is, that's great. But also, you need to show what your contribution to your discipline is. Now, that might be something, uh, particularly in the hard sciences, it may be you've created a new method or a new technique. Or in the high humanities, you've used the literature in a really different and interesting way. But also think about it, translocalism, our vlog last week. What was your context? 
What was your location, your space and place that enabled you to write this thesis at this time? So think translocalism. Your knowledge has emerged from this particular context. So tell me about that context. This is so important for all of us who are working outside of Europe and outside of North America. We have a right, we have a responsibility to write back to empire, if you will. We are in this odd, interesting position in the world. So let's describe the view. And you do some of that in the conclusion. Explain what your location and context has given to your discipline. Five. Controversial point, this one, what went wrong? What went wrong? Now, it might be the goth in me, and this is a bit of a controversial point, but what went wrong? There is incredible value in describing in a thesis what went wrong. I know a lot of colleagues say, oh, look, don't admit weakness. Look, examiners are some of the brightest people on the planet. If something has gone wrong, they found it. So you need to acknowledge it and go, yes, absolutely, that went wrong. This, this went wrong, or well, this didn't go quite as well as we had. And that's great. So what went wrong? What would you or colleagues, fellow researchers, do differently next time? And what would happen? Now, examiners love these paragraphs. In oral examinations, they love these discussions, OK? What went wrong? Because it shows the researcher, you, a PhD student, is reflexive about your methods. So again, that meta expertise, what went wrong? Six, future work. Now this is linked with, of course, what went wrong, because it's also presenting future work, future trajectories that emerge from your thesis. Now, it may be your future work, or it may be for other people, these areas are emerging from the scholarship I have conducted here. Now, in the social sciences and in the health sciences in particular, this future work often overlaps with your recommendations. And we see this particularly in social work, but also in allied health. So what you are recommending in your research will also improve practice. Very, very common in allied health. Sometimes in the thesis, this is referred to as extendability. I love that as a word, by the way, extendability. So there is a section of your conclusion that discusses extendability. What's next? What can be stretched from this thesis? Boom. Seven, impact, relevance, and consequences. Impact, relevance, and consequences. The argument in the literature that impact is actually discipline specific, to be frank with you, I don't think so. What is the impact of your research? How has your research made some sort of impact or intervention in society? So yes, there is your original contribution to knowledge, and that is the deal breaker in terms of the PhD. But impact is a little bit different. It could be social, economic, political, theoretical, I could go on and on and on. So specify that impact in the conclusion. So just to give you an example from one of my great students, hello Roz. Uh, Roz is working on financial planning for women in regional Australia, right? Great topic, wow. Now she has made profound theoretical and empirical original contributions to knowledge. In fact, she's created a new model to think about women and financial planning. So that's her original contribution to knowledge and wow, it's a huge one, right? But the impact of her research is a little bit different and really far reaching, I think. So it's really about women, business and regional development. And in some ways, her research has an impact on thinking about the history of women in Australia. That's how powerful that thesis is. So you can see how the original contribution to knowledge and the impact or the relevance can be actually quite different and often are, particularly in the social sciences. Eight writing matters. Now there's no doubt with all the emails and correspondence I've received, the writing issue is becoming a blockage for students. They have such high expectations on themselves in the conclusion that they're paralysed, right? 
So they don't know where to start and therefore they're sort of sitting there not able to even write a word, okay? So what I would say to you is give yourself permission to write pretty well nonsense, to just have a go, just free yourself up a bit, okay? Just get the ideas down. Don't judge the words, don't judge the sentences, just slam down the ideas. And what I get for my students, what I get my students to do, if they've had and are having a blockage, and can I say it's worked every single time, so, you know, they just, they can't write. They just, something's happened and they just, they just stopped, right? So what I get my students to do is actually put the computer aside for a time and I get them to speak the argument. So what I get my students to do is, okay, don't think about writing for a moment. What I want you to do for me is answer my question. And my question is, why should I give a damn about your thesis? Why should I give a damn about your thesis? Now, you might like to try this, because what I get the students to then do is press the record memo on their phone and record their answer to that question. Why should I give a damn about your thesis? So the great thing about that is, because they're often, often a bit provocative, well, this is why you need to care, Tara. And that's good, I want the energy, I, I, I want the anger, I want the vibe, right? So once you have that sonic file, what you then do is put your headphones on and pretty well transcribe that into words on your computer screen. Don't worry about the pros at this point, get the ideas down. Now that will free you up and all of a sudden you'll have a shape to your conclusion and you can start to draft. And the reason why it's important to get the ideas down in some form and then draft is the best writing in your thesis should be in the conclusion. You need to finish that thesis with a bang and not with a whimper. But I don't want to put pressure on you because I just want to say to you that the best writing always starts as truly dreadful writing. The best writing starts with this explosion of ill-ordered ideas. The best writers are actually the best editors. You should see my first drafts. They are absolutely dreadful. They are humiliating. But I am a very, very good editor. So when people say you're a great writer, it's actually, well, I'm a great editor. I know how to work my prose up. So just slam the ideas down and then start to edit your prose. But remember, if you are completely overwhelmed, and it happens to every student somewhere in the journey, is just start with the recording of ideas. Change the sound into the vision. Change the voice into words. And then you can draft it up from there. So what you need to do is leave your examiner with a ripper of an ending, yeah? So they feel excited, they feel energised. Oh, this has something to say. And that's how you get a fantastic mark, by the way. Nine, important one, don't underclaim and don't overclaim. Be very clear what your research shows. What does your research do? What does your research not do? Be very, very clear. What are the implications of what it does? What are the implications of what it doesn't do? It is crucial that you start to think about the implications of your research beyond that summary of findings. So what do your summaries mean? And your research, your conclusion, should provide the answer to that question. Now, don't be grandiose. This is again the tip for punters. Don't be grandiose. If you've undertaken a small study, that's, that's great. That's absolutely brilliant. Respectful of the small studies, that's cool. Remember, that's a great theses often are small studies. But then don't over-egg that omelette. Don't suggest, oh, right, well, this, this small study involving six people in Geraldton in Western Australia will transform Australia's national policy. That's over-egging the omelette. Or, say, your small study provides a singular and correct way to do a particular task. That's a generalisation. Don't do it. You'll be hammered pretty strongly for that. If your research is groundbreaking, then you need to explain carefully and precisely how it is groundbreaking. So therefore, and this is an important bit, this is where you get to the length of a good PhD conclusion, 5,000, 10,000 words. 
don't rush through the implications of your study. Explain how what you've done here can forward policy, can forward practice, and offer a series of pathways to future research trajectories and refer back to the literature when you do this. So if I can, I'll try and go on the side. So, so say, this is what my thesis has done. It built on this literature and it provides this pathway to future research. This is what my thesis has done. It worked from this component of the literature and it leads to here. See that sort of iterative shape? That's what you're doing in the conclusion. Very important. Ten. We're there, 10. Don't rely on an examiner's benevolence. Don't rely on an examiner simply feeling good about your thesis and they'll simply pass it. The best examiners assess you and assess the project and look, we do want the best for you. What I do, to be honest with you, and I read a PhD about five or six times before I do my final report, but the first time I read it, I'm sitting down in my chair because I read it all the way through before I take any notes. And I sit down with it in my chair and, you know, I say, good luck, Michelle. Or, you know, Phil, I hope it goes really well for you. I actually speak it out loud, like, good luck, mate, let's do this. Because you're sort of together going through this examination process, even if it's you with the thesis in a room. So we come to it wishing you well, okay? But you do need to convince us. So we wish you well, but you need to convince us. And the conclusion is the point where you convince us. So please remember the examiner when you're writing the conclusion. Always worries me when students focus so strongly, oh, what does my supervisor think? What does my supervisor think? The one thing I can guarantee is your supervisor is not going to examine your thesis. The examiner is. So think as an examiner when you are writing your conclusion. Make them feel relaxed. Make them feel like they're really confident to pass you. Oh, this is good. This is good. Yeah, this is fine. This is not a worry, let's pass this. That's how we feel. Oh, we're actually relieved. We don't want to fail. We don't want to do major corrections. We go, we take a breath. So we open to the conclusion, go, here we go. It's like, oh, wow, it's a good conclusion. Yeah, that's how we feel. It's a relief. So the conclusion is important because it's the space that you demonstrate clearly and without issue what you have done and why. So team, the biggest mistake that people make in the conclusion is they simply restate the findings, they confuse a summary with a conclusion. Yes, present the summary, but that's not the point of a conclusion. Why does the thesis matter? If you're stuck, put that down as a heading in your conclusion. Why does my thesis matter? And write that section up for me. That should loosen you up. So don't present new ideas. Present the meta-thesis, why we care about your research, and to be honest with you, if you introduce new material into the conclusion, we as examiners think you're lazy because when you see that new material in a conclusion, what invariably happens is people have slammed together three publications. It's often three. I wish it was five, but like here are three publications completely unedited. That's how it appeared in the journal. Let's just slam them in there. And therefore, what's the link between them or what's going on here? And so the conclusion has to do heavy lifting because the chapters have not done the heavy lifting, right? So we just go, well, this is just embarrassing. It's like, well, the conclusion is not a thesis. You needed to do the thesis to end up with a great conclusion. So discuss the limitations, discuss the problems. Don't hide them, don't mask them. Good science, good scholarship, good research presents the problems and explains why they matter. What went wrong, that's the characteristic of the best research. And what we want as examiners, is that personal and intellectual reflexivity. We don't want a personal rant. Occasionally we see, particularly I would argue in the humanities, someone just having a, you know, well, this is what I think. Dude, not too bothered what you think. Rather interested in what your research reveals. So be aware of the difference. This is a considered reflection on your research, on your thesis. So carry your reader, your examiner, with you to your new way of thinking, your new way of writing, your original contribution to knowledge. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.